Welcome. We have a full range of ages here today. So nice. I like it. That's temple practice. Fantastic. <clears throat> The topic uh, is one of the um, limbs of the Eightfold Path, Right Livelihood. Right Livelihood um, is really like, how should we live our lives like that? It isn't like, don't have this job or just don't have that job, but how how do we do that? That's what I'd like to talk about today, how we actually make decisions um, from a um, little bit inner yogic. We have some very smart people here today, so I'm sure you can follow me, um, right? <clears throat> so today I don't want to say, well, we, all, we should be doing this, we should be doing that, recycling, we should be voting this way, we should be voting that way, we should be not eating this, not, you know, not on that. Um, we, we've, we've all pretty much made our decisions by now, haven't we? So um, we're gradually perhaps changing some of our lifestyles, but uh, I want to talk about how we actually um, move forward, initiate action, um, do things. The Buddha was very interested in um, effort and doing things. <clears throat> perhaps he was um, a little bit reacting to what he saw as uh, eternalistic views of the time. Um, that not only were spiritual, religious, but translated into the caste system or into a fatalistic karmic system. So uh, he was always talking about change, always talking about impermanence. So uh, the right livelihood we're talking about is how, how do we do intelligent change? How do we know when we're um, making the right decision? <clears throat> Generally, these kind of remarks are saved for uh, uh, deep yogic work um, because generally Buddhism from Asia is um, what we'd say in religious studies is normative, right? Normative means I just want you to pay, you know, pay attention to the roles and um, be a good boy and girl, you know, and everyone knows the truth and we know the norms, so just do it, okay? I mean, really... I, I think in a normative way most of the time, don't don't you guys? I mean, I want people to drive on the right side of the street. I want them to pay their bills on time. You know, I, I want people to, you know, just kind of, you know, just follow things along. I don't have to be reinventing relationships every single minute, right? Or um, how the chairs are arranged, <laughs> things like that. So uh, most of uh, uh, traditional dharma, of course, uh, is we just want people to behave. Now, we, now generally, um, if we are reacting to our religion or origin, we're going, well, I just don't want to behave. But um, actually, we all want people to behave the way we want them to behave, don't we? To be honest, <laughs> like either stop shouting or start shouting or, you know, so... <clears throat> Uh, we have a lot of judgments about what right livelihood is and how people should be leading their lives. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not um, trying to make a moral argument uh, today that you should be doing a certain thing or not. Is that clear? However, I know people like those arguments. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, the world is full of people haranguing each other about what should happen. But um, I'm trying to take us inside a little bit more to see how how actually um, any kind of decisions are made, actually how the mind-body process works, something like that. <clears throat> I recognize um, that uh, I could be a complete failure, um, and this is a difficult subject. Um, crying babies are okay. Gives, gives me a little break. I can just stop for a second, you know. So, to, <laughs> so like, yeah, it's, it's not going to be that kind of talk, you know, where people had. Uh, yeah. Um, 
in in a in a closed retreat setting, of course, you want things very quiet, right? Uh, monastery. This is not a monastery. It's not a school. It's it's not a retreat center. It's a temple. So, um, we're creating a like a Shambhala situation where a whole bunch of different people can get together and um, enjoy each other's company for a short period of time. Makes sense. <clears throat> Good news uh, from Dharma point of view um, is people are basically good. When when we've been injured or when we see people injuring others and we see the state of the world, sometimes it's hard to uh, draw that conclusion, but we have to keep saying it, particularly from a Vajrayana point of view. Our basic goodness is indestructible. <clears throat> There's uh, no outside forces from a Dharma point of view creating evil or craziness. Um, we're, we're totally making a mess of it ourselves. Uh, uh, once again, the good news is we really don't want to make a mess of it. We we do want to be happy and free. <clears throat> uh, but this idea is that um, we're basically good. We want to be happy and free, but um, we make some bad choices. Probably everyone's kind of on the. Are we? That's that's kind of. That's easy, right? We all got that. Show of hands. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the difficult part is how, how do you make choices? Very few teachers actually talk about that. How you know, not just you should make a choice or you should have good motivation, you should make the right thing, but how how do we actually do it? That's, how, how do we do that? Difficult. If you get really inside it, it's it's hard to see how does, how does, how does it work? How do we start a new activity? How do we stop an activity? How do we uh, decide what kind of thing we want to think or say or do? Getting back to norms again, we really, really when we're honest, we we don't want people to be one hundred percent honest with us. <laughs> so, you know, we're we want people to edit what they say, right? And um, we generally want to edit what we say. Isn't it annoying when we say things that are just totally like awkward? Yes. So <clears throat> maybe from. <clears throat> Uh, from one point of view, um, like Mahasiddha point of view is, um, you know, say whatever's uh, on your mind and it just comes out, but then um, you'll know you're not a Mahasiddha because then you won't want the consequences of that, right? Everybody wants to say exactly what they're on their mind, but then they don't always want to hang with the consequences because people are not always happy when we say exactly what's on our mind. Isn't that so? There's a wonderful teacher that I sponsored um, to come through Sacramento um, many years. Um, the only person I, I knew at the time was uh, my friend Mike Hatfield. Mike, thank you for being there. I don't know if you went to this talk, but it was Kusum Lingpa was uh, a very interesting teacher who... Um, we did say uh, whatever we wanted to. Um, it was really delightful. Um, he uh, read a book by one of his Western students, and the student and his followers would, you know, introduce them to different people. Um, uh, you know, as you do, you introduce your teacher, particularly to nice people with maybe money and funds to help your teacher. And, and um, <laughs> Kusum Lengpa would just say, give me $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 
uh you know like maybe the first time you know it'd be like haha just kidding but then he'd stick with it <laughs> and maybe it was more than that i'm not sure you know i think occasionally it worked but lots of times it backfired so he didn't seem upset about it according to this person but all his you know students and handlers were right you know They were going, yeah, I know you're a great Mahasiddha and you're enlightened and everything, but can't you just kind of, just for this one donor, you know, don't, 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 don't approach it that way. They don't like that. You know, you just do it anyway. <laughs> I really liked him. I didn't have any money at the time, so he didn't ask me for money. So that was, I don't have any negative feel about it. It's great. Mm. So, uh, all of Buddha Dharma um, uh, is meant to liberate us, um, to get us unstuck. So, all the words, all the practices are like turning words, we call them. Um, just like skillful means, so that... Um, you stop uh, making everything into a thing, people into a thing, ourselves into a thing, things into a thing, making it all solid and and um, unworkable and aggressive and not fun, you know. So basically, the Buddha um, had you know really just one word, which is the third noble truth. Do people know what the third noble truth is? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Crickets. The alleviation of suffering is possible. Oh, thank you, Matthew. I can I can die in peace now. That's correct. Um, Naroda, uh, basically, like stop it. So that is a wonderful. <laughs> <clears throat> um. Who who is the comedian, you know, that had that famous skit called Stop It, right? Yeah, Bob Newhart. Yeah, so it's kind of required watching in grad school um, uh, because that's basically, you know, all, all we say on some level, you know, someone's coming in and fantastic actress and it's, you know i i can't stop thinking about that you know i'm going to be buried alive you know in this casket and um <laughs> but goes okay well let me explain my fee structure um for the first five minutes that's five dollars you know because it's a dollar a minute which kind of made sense back then and he said can i have five dollars please <laughs> that's hysterical from the therapist's point of view but anyway she goes and, you know, I, I need to go over, you know, I just need to get over that that fear that I'm going to be buried alive. And he goes, okay, um, here it is. Stop it. Oh. <laughs> and then she looks blank, obviously, and goes, S-T-O-P, next word, I-D. So, you know. <clears throat> There's more to that. You'll have to look it up. <clears throat> It's, it's a little bit similar to another skit, kind of a little tangent, um, nail in the head. You know, if anybody knows that one, look it up. YouTube, nail in the head, explains a lot of relationship problems. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're all the skillful means is basically just just stop it, okay? But you know that's that's too bald, right? That's too you know, direct. So we have all these skillful means teachings. <clears throat> the point being that uh, the the teachings aren't really meant to explain nature of reality or how you know stuff or how people should behave. Just stop it. Now, <clears throat> growing up in the culture of India, just similar to America, there were a lot of competing. Um, philosophies and patrons too. Um, so Buddha Dharma and the Buddha, uh, even during lifetimes, said, "Well, 
um, a few people um, just uh, quickly on um, just kind of stopped it. Uh, one of those, of course, that I'm favorite quoting is like Shariputra, who's kind of being part of the Sutra, Heart Sutra. Also, um, I'll just tell it again because I like it. As Shariputra was a well-known yoga teacher at the time who didn't want to be seen going to see the Buddha because then he would lose cred with his students. So he, he didn't go to any of the lectures. He just waited outside the lecture until a monk came out. And Shariputra said, well, you know, what did Shakyamuni say? It was Siddhartha and the new monk said, well, I really don't know. I'm just brand new. But he said something in the effect that um, uh, the Tathagata elucidated the uh, causes um, and effects that if you remove the cause, the effect is removed. And what happened? Right there, I just woke up. That's a stop at night. That's right there. It's kind of an explanation of reality, but it's just... <clears throat> But in India and here too, we have to spend a lot of time describing reality and that's ontology, you know, what is reality? Uh, and then we have to spend a lot of time in epistemology, like how do we know what we know? And then we have to spend a lot of time in ethics, like please be good boys and girls and be nice to each other, you know, all these things. But um, those don't totally get to just stop it. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to be a failure because I'm going to, I'm not, I've already said stop it and you didn't. So, uh, but, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of ontological, epistemological, moral lecturing today. Um, in the, in the Buddha Dharma program, which I'm putting on hold until I revamp it, people said, you're on a rant. Yes, you know, I, I was on a rant. Lamas are supposed to go on rants. So just so you know, um, and and <laughs> my traditional teachers like you go, you go ask you ask one question, but it's blank. Or can you tell me about blank? You have a private interview, a darshan, and then they talk at you for the length of time that they want to, which generally um, is no more than fifteen minutes, like when. Kansar Rimshi was here, he got 15 minutes, right? That's standard, right? That would be maybe twice, well, once a year if you're a good student, twice if you're an excellent student, twice a year, you could have you know 30 minutes, just, just so you know. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> I'm gonna have to do a little bit of explanation and a little bit of moralizing and ranting. Um, raise your hands if you're open to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> they bought they bought it. So now okay. <clears throat> Make um good decisions from Buddhist point of view. Um we consider things from uh the standpoint of interdependence. This was the Buddha's awakening. Uh he woke to complete interdependence. Um, it's a long word, so Mahayana folks like ourselves decided to just say emptiness. Same thing, okay? <clears throat> For our purposes, interdependence uh, from an energetic decision point of view means there's generally always like two polarities. There's like a good idea. I mean, this is a little bit too bold. A good idea and a bad idea. Or usually um, a good idea and a good idea. That's the problem, right? Things are obviously stupid, bad, and wrong. We're not going to do it. But usually they're kind of two okay ideas. So what do we do? In our tradition, after we've done lots of um, a softening of the mind and devotional work and healthy lifestyle, and we learn how to do calming concentration meditation, otherwise known as uh, Shine and Tibetan Shamatha and um, 
Sanskrit and well, concentration, calming, or placement meditation in English. What that really means is we are able to hold um, both ideas or polarities together at the same time evenly. That's not easy to do. That, that's kind of a form of stop it because bringing things to um, balance, to a halt, so you really, really, really don't favor one over the other is difficult. Do you agree? Well, if you've tried it, you would know it's difficult because usually we, you know, usually our life is flipping a coin. We really, you know, say, I oh, hope it's heads or, you know, it's like we have a bias, right? So it's really difficult to have a non-biased mind that's willing to see um, both uh, polarities or the opposites or both good things completely evenly. This goes for people too. It's really difficult. So that's why we you know, do all our prayers and other kinds of meditation so we can just have that glance where we just, that things just line up. When uh, things line up like that, um, I'm talking inner yogic work. So actually, if you don't do any meditation, you won't know anything I'm talking about, but I'm going to keep talking anyway. That's called the rant. You'll have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm going to keep talking, and that's the rant, right? So when, when uh, things are totally lined up in deep shamatha, um, they, they don't stay stuck. So it's similar when we're doing the winds and channels and drops. When you bring things into the central channel, they don't just they they they're not just like stuck in there. Like you know, you have a broom stuck up your back. Things move. So that's what's interesting is when we bring things to. You know, I'm using my hands here because this is my do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it, don't do it. What do you mean don't do it? No, do it. Which one? No, okay. So you bring them, do you remember Sherry Lewis? <laughs> um, <clears throat> lamb chop. So when you, when you bring them to evenness and stop, um, there's kind of, um, I'm calling it a click. You actually don't get a click, but I'm calling it a click. So don't literally, but, it's like a click, like, uh, and there are various, um, of course, physical and emotional things that happen when you when things come to a complete rest or stop like that. But um, we should know that there's not a permanent stop. You see, when they're balanced, then they start moving. So then, and like in central channel, the other two channels, the you know white and red, then 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 things go like this. They're not tied up around the chakras and they're going like this. And when, um, so they move like this, so they start kind of going this way. You think, oh, you know, unexperienced people kind of freak out. They go like, oh, I'm losing it, you know, but you're not, you know, just let it. Because it'll go to its expansion, like crown and, and down to, uh, you know, root chakra or a secret place, whatever. But then they start doing this. And it's it's when they they cross, I call it switching. When they cross, there's a little, there's a bliss moment, right? But the bliss moment isn't, you know, you're thinking, well, I'm doing tantra on the bliss, but it's not really helping decide, like, should I get a loan for 7% or should I wait until the, you know, now, because they've offered a loan at 7%, or shall I wait and see if the rates go down further? Well, would you, you know, what, you know, it's like, how is anything in Dharma going to help you do that, right? You know, so, but actually it does, because if you hold them together, bring them to uh, unbiased rest, then, then they move, and when they come, when they cross, you're present for that when the different energies are 
uh, delays cross, um, then this this just kind of like, you know, you know those kind of like, you just had an idea, it just came to you. That That's when these polarities are, they're in balance, but they're moving and they, it's a little like a collide. And that's that's the choice, you see. Itself is the choice. It's light and it's blissful, and it's the choice. You know, that feeling where you just know what to do. You're in the zone, it happened, it's just real. You go like, one of three goes sooner. You know, it's just just like that. But it's it's not an impulsive choice. It, it's it's not like a biased choice. It seems to have come kind of from nowhere, really. But we, we know it hasn't. We know it's come because we've set in motion or we're allowing it to be in motion in the right way. So that's why I, in this, you know, in the Sangha emphasize, we have to have some basis in concentration or calmness or you won't be able to bring things, you know, you won't be able to even them up, right? You, know, you you won't even be able to hang a picture frame, you know, that, which is tricky. Have you ever tried hanging picture frames without rulers or anything? <laughs> it's like, and then you step back and you go, oh. or, or your partner comes in the house and goes, no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, that, that, um, uh, we sometimes call it an intuitive insight, something like that. Um, uh, inner Dharma practitioners actually, actually know how that process kind of works. You see, we, we set ourselves up, so we know how it is. Um, we know that even blind squirrels get a net once in a while. So even when we're kind of confused, sometimes we actually have had some really good ideas or things, and good ideas can be like, don't do it. Those are good ideas too. Like, there's some stupid things um, that actually I haven't done in my life because I've had a little voice that said, "Don't do it," or just a thought that says, "Don't do it." So that th those are good too, right? So the um, and the very inner process, um, it's it's necessary for uh, we to develop both this kind of experience of calm and movement, but uh, absolutely necessary to have uh, the interdependent poles in front of us, right? So on a simple level, uh, we are meditating on uh, cause and effect. We are meditating on interdependence because you can't have a cause without an effect or effect without a cause, right? Most people, they're making decisions without thinking that much ahead because the cause feels so good. But we don't think about the effect, isn't that so? So <clears throat> once again, we we develop, we do take a lot of time in preliminary meditations to discern what are the real issues here. Lawyers do this and accountants do too, like because they'll lecture me. I go, well, what are the what are the real issues here? What are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to do this and not do that. Okay, let's look at do this and don't do that. But you have to hold them together. That's hard if you're just kind of like, I don't want to hear why it won't work, just tell me how it'll work. No, we have to look at both at the same time. We can look at the same time without the bias and wait and wait. Then they will start getting activated. But then you have to wait again, too, because you think, okay, they're moving this way. Or you have to wait until on their own they reconnect. See, it's a dynamic process. Mm. So this is just a little bit about the inner thing. How I'm not talking about content of decisions at all or what you should do. Um, but actually how, how it actually works, something like that. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a little break from this thing. So that's my rant for today. Hmm. We have some times for complaints or comments. 
There we go. Thank you. That's mm. thought provoking. Um, you know, you said you have to wait. And what that says to me is that the waiting is um, part of the discipline. That's 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 the discipline of everyday practice. Mm -hmm. that um, if you just wait that one time that you really need a decision and so I'm going to wait, but you haven't been waiting for weeks before that and no, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you, you sort of create a container that allows a container of silence, a container, I don't know about silence, but a container of waiting of, I don't know, I can't think of another word. Um, then, then it can happen. But if you haven't done, or at least for me, if I haven't done a really consistent practice, mm -hmm. then no amount of waiting works. Yes, you have to do the practice. Or the, this, this system will be operating on a certain level, but it won't be conscious, and you won't yeah. get um, uh, the sense of... Um, sparkiness or clarity or release yeah true sometimes it feels like the decision isn't um so polarized like so pre-polarization it feels more like a general field of infinite possibilities. And, you know, before bringing it into sort of the simple, yes, no, should I this, should I that, you know, is there anything, any any tips about distilling the decision-making process to make it a little bit simpler so that it's not, you know, should I accept this 7% loan or wait for a better one? Because in my mind, sometimes it's like, yeah, uh, should I accept this 7%? Should I wait for another? Should I go borrow money from a friend? Should I not be buying mm. this house? Should I, you know, go make a pizza? Should You know, like there's infinite range of possibilities and it hasn't yet been distilled into this sort of simple binary system. <clears throat> yeah, good question. Um, so this is where... Um, a lot of yogis fall down um, because um, we're um, using uh, stoner logic. <laughs> so uh, I want and I don't want it at the same time. Whereas actually the nervous system, uh, uh, it's doing a lot uh, all the time, but it's it's still like a computer, it's still zeros and ones. So uh, we have to keep that in mind that it, uh, we, we may have to build up a, um, a hierarchy of decisions when there's a big issue in hand. So I'm not just saying you just do a one-off and everything, but um, we have to bring things down to this kind of fork in the road. And that's why the, there's so much emphasis um, and the traditional lineage is actually on logic and debate, because at some point, like, you're either here or you're not, you know, like, and uh, stoner logic, which I used to be really good at, hopefully not so good at, um, is, well, it's not what it is, but it's not different than either. <laughs> it's totally ridiculous, right? You know, or both and, you know, so if, if we're actually reading texts and listening to the teachings and uh, some interest in actually logic. It doesn't have to be just Buddhist logic. Um, we we don't like it, but um, things can't simultaneously be, be A and not A at the same time. We don't like that. We, we want our cake and eat it too. 
and of course, uh, uh, you know, so much of Buddhism is a recovery model, a recovery from idiotic thinking, right? That we can have our cake and eat it too. But big decisions would be, uh, there's a matrix or a mandala of decisions around, you know, something rather big, but it still has to come down to, um, you know, you're either going to have, you know, like when you have kids, you have to say, uh, you, you never ask, what do you want for lunch? You always say, do you want peanut butter or tuna fish? That's all we got. But there are infinite possibilities, but they're all going to kind of follow that. Okay, so you got tuna fish, but then you can either have mayo or mustard. Or somebody says, well, I want both. You know, then you can say, well, you could either have both or, or you know, we'll have to take out the tomato. You know, see, so it, it's it's still going to go that way. It goes very rapidly in our mind, and we just generally don't see how it operates because we're doing these computations. Um, uh, I was reading some article, which I like. I said, um, let's be clear. Um, human beings are the ones that make the computations. Computers carry them out. Something like that. For you nerds out there, like me. Thank you. Hi, Lama. You, ha you had talked earlier today about different types of meditations, and I'm wondering if there are meditations on the winds and channels and drops. Yes. What are they? They're extensive. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give an example? Yeah, so... Um, when we're when we're talking about that level of um, completion practice or tantra, then of course, uh, ideally, or in this case, um, necessarily, in our song, you know, we have to have the right relationship with our practice and ourselves. So when you're doing um, that inner work, which involves visualization and um, strong attention to inner experiences and proprioceptive experiences. Then um, uh, uh, you know you have to ha you know then you have to do it then the meditations and then come back and go I don't know my central channel is kind of green uh, what do I do you know I mean it, it has to be a dialogue like that otherwise um, the inner yogas um, be become ex actually exoteric and most are now anyway so. Anything that we get on the internet, it could be true. Like here's a picture of you know, a central channel and the white and red side, and here's a picture of the chakras. But in a way, that's exoteric because um, it's coming from the outside, right? So um, with our personal teacher, it's not, you know, we never regard our personal teacher as outside. So it's all inner. So that's the basic thing is when we're doing completion inner practices, we're you know, what the Tibetans would call an inner person. So we, we just need to talk more about it. But um, the, there's, there's so much written now um, and published from doing completion practices um, that that's good, but there's also silly stuff. But the problem is the books and the internet and, you know, you go to you Google an image and go, okay, you know, central channel and you get tons of graphics, right? Um, you know, it's it's kind of like, uh, you know, when when you're a kid coming upon something adult, you know, it, it kind of looks like you could do it, but you don't get how it fits. So we'll just have to talk. Is that okay? Yay. I've talked about this on retreat, you know. Um, once again, the inner, um, when we're talking about uh, these inner yogas, um, they're, they're presented classically as normative, ontological, and epistemological, like this is just the way it is. You, you, you have this, and it looks like this, and uh, this is the way it is. Because uh, um, uh, all the information is presented kind of objectively and normatively. But um, uh, that's not the way we actually process it. It's because uh, teachers have to um, 
the Buddha had said, well, I'm willing to teach more than one person at a time. So whenever you're teaching more than one person at a time, like now, you have to kind of have these, well, normative um, viewpoints and setups. But, um, uh, you know, like you're saying, well, okay, I'm a 40 regular and, you know, um, clothing modif you know, metaphors are big with me. But if you really want to uh, do Tantra, the correct way is always bespoke. It has to be bespoke clothing, right? That's 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 the real thing, which um, takes more time. It's okay to buy some dharma off the rack, and usually, if like if you're, you know, you go in and go to whatever store, and you're literally like, you know, a perfect size one or something, or you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You can buy stuff off the rack, but actually. Um, even then it's it doesn't it doesn't feel the same as if um uh, something was made just for you. So we'll talk. How's that? Hey. La la la. Hey. Any other questions? Online? This means everything I said has made perfect sense. <laughs> um, you're not thinking, I don't know what this has to do with my daily life. This, you know, but, um, uh, you know, big things start out very small. This is kind of tantric thinking, but also biology. Big things start out really small and generally hidden in dark places. And that's how human beings start, right? You start out really small in a, you know, kind of dark contained place and we grow. I mean, how's it happen? You've got these little teeny, you know, like an egg and sperm and how, how do we get so big? What happened? Why aren't we still kids? What, what happened? You know, we just kept getting older and we had to learn stuff and scrape our knees and get married and divorced and bankruptcy and you know, whatever, or success or whatever. How do we get so big? But things start out super small, and that's a really important um, Buddhist idea, particularly Kala Chakra, which we'll be doing it too. Whereas other religions tend to think like, well, you just, you just pop out like this, right? So the Buddha understood that um, things actually start very momentary and small and kind of build and grow so you know i really like uh, the greek goddess athena right um uh she was supposed to have like uh the metaphor is different I mean, it just popped out of um zeus's head right you know um didn't didn't go through the usual um birth process, right? Um, just like we say, like the Garuda just pops out of the shell fully flying. That isn't to say there's not a causal growth that goes in, but when um, uh, interdependence really works, then it feels, you know, when you're really surfing it, it feels like totally complete experience. So it isn't, when we say interdependence, it doesn't mean you just see parts. Um, uh, you know things have had to come together to create, but it, they don't feel like parts when um, uh, when things actually meet in the middle. It feels like a completely whole experience like that. You guys are lucky to get this talk. I mean, because, you know, most, most teachers aren't going to talk this way, will they? No, they just... We'll give you exoteric teachings because they don't know you. And of course, our visiting teachers are wonderful. We'd like to get to know Geshe Tsewa and Geshe Kenshin better, um, you know, Kansa Rinpoche and so forth. And then you can have individual discussions. But they're always going to give exoteric teachings, not not so. But I'm getting going a little deeper, don't you think? Yeah. Okay. Are we hungry now? Are we ready to take a break? Okay. Thank you.
meditation. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen rise and grow, may that which has arisen not diminish but increase. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful chairs and tents and yes. Please remain until some song ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness. May they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lausanne, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of the stream and the profound the vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objects and passion, master of all wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Sonkapa, crown jewel, snowland, stages, I make request for So I think we have a, do we have a potluck lunch maybe? I think it's so incredible. People are still bringing, pot, uh, just those of you that are bringing food for people, it's incredible, you know, we're still doing it. So I'm, I'm going to hang out and then we'll do Kala Chakra too. Any other announcements? Yes, uh, we we uh, have um, some visiting teachers this month, and if you look on the Lions Roar website, um, you can see them clearly listed. We also have a newsletter, The Roar, but we have uh, Geshe Gendon's coming for a workshop, and uh, Susan, who's sitting over here, knows more about it than I do. I'm going to bring the mic so she can explain it to you a little better. That's actually in October, right? Yes. Well, I'm not going to be like a fountain of knowledge here, but um, Gishigan is going to be here on October 5th, which Struggling is battery, moderate because of your and that disease. the next Delic workshop. Um, so it'll be based around the paramitas and having to do with chaplaincy. Geshe Gendon, uh has been a Buddhist chaplain um, in hospitals for many, many years. And um, also on Saturday, there will be an opportunity to have um, private interviews with him, probably before um, the workshop and maybe a little bit after the workshop as well. So that's on Saturday the 5th. And then I guess he's teaching here on Sunday the 6th. So we're very lucky. He's an old, old friend of Lions Roar. So I'm totally delightful. Hmm? I do not. Maybe 10 ish, 10 30 ish. Yeah. Yeah. 11 ish. <laughs> right? So I don't know the exact. Um, I'll, I'll have more details later and it'll be in the roar too. Thank you for teaching us today, Rinpoche. Um, I just wanted to mention too to look on the website about Geshe Sewang, who's coming in. Um, we'll tell you more about that later, but on the 27th is going to be a medicine food empowerment. So um, anyway, thank you. Of this month. Of this month, uh, October 27th. What did I say? September? This is September. Yes, October 27th. Okay, next month. My apology. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you for Preta yeah. Forte Dharma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yes, there's a membership committee meeting at three o'clock. Everyone is welcome to attend and help us uh, look at ways to increase our membership here. Thanks.